I'm going to pick up um, themes from both our previous talks, so thanks to both the earlier speakers. I'm going to talk a little bit at first about children and difficulty, um, particularly how many problems there are and how heavily they impinge on schools. And then I'm going to talk um, about a trial that has just completed. So I'm going to show you some data that literally I was sitting just before the coffee break and got a text from NIHR saying, yes, you can present it. But I would ask you when I get to that slide, please don't photograph it, please don't tweet it, because it's not peer-reviewed data, so I don't want it going outside this room. Um, and I should also say, please follow those slides, not the ones in your pack, because I'm a fiddler and I've switched around the, the order, and if people are desperate to have these slides, I'll make sure that you get them afterwards. These data are very old. Many of the, you um, will have seen them before, but in case you haven't, these are the British Child and Adolescent Mental Health Survey results. There was one survey in 1999 and another in 2004, and if you invite me back in a year or two, there is one in the field currently. And that's really exciting because these data are very old. Um, they measured the level of psychiatric disorder, and I use the term advisedly. There were standardized diagnostic assessments that involved interviews with parents, with young people if they were 11 or over, and when the family agreed, teachers were mailed a questionnaire. And they, those information were put together by clinical child psychiatrists as they would in a clinic to assign diagnoses by um, standardized criteria. And the upshot is about one in 10 children, so that's two or three and an average class of 25 to 30 children, have a clinical level of difficulty. The other thing I'd like you to notice is the commonest dis disorder or problem is very severe behavior problems. And now, you know, I hesitate to talk about conduct disorder with Stephen sitting in the audience. Um, but this, I, I heard recently um, someone say, oh, we, we need to make sure that um, teachers and people in the education system don't equate mental health with bad behavior and, and not talk about behavior. But actually, it is the commonest mental health problem in, in children. It actually predicts to every adult mental health disorder, including anxiety and depression, not just substance misuse and personality disorder. So behavior problems are hugely, hugely important, but so are the other problems. However, um, like Jeffrey Rose, a famous epidemiologist, would say every medical condition, they are spectrums. So we put an artificial cut point, and the blue arrows indicate the suggested cut points for the SDQ. So on, the, on your far left, we have the young people's report, and then we have parents and we have teachers from the 2004 <coughs> survey. And there isn't a sharp distinction between those who meet diagnostic criteria and those who don't. And the implication for that for our schools is that for every one child with a psychiatric disorder, there are probably three or four who are struggling. And a lot of our interventions may well be effective for those children too. But it means we have a significant, as, as Richard said this morning, we have a huge burden of morbidity in terms of distress and difficulty in our child population. These are also ancient data, but I think they bear repeating. They're from my PhD, where I studied the proportion of children with a psychiatric disorder in 1999 who had seen any service in relation to their mental health three years later. And those are the different services. And I think the first thing I want you to take away is that teachers are the go-to mental health service for parents. These were parent reports. And I have many friends and colleagues who are teachers, and they don't feel very very prepared for that role. Um, so it's something we need to think about in terms of training teachers and supporting our <coughs> colleagues who are teachers because parents will ask them because they're accessible, because they're a professional that work with, with um, children. And for those teachers in the audience, if you haven't discovered MindEd, if you haven't been to the Youth in Mind website, if you just Google Youth in Mind, those are high quality resources about mental health in children which will give you a wealth of information. The next thing to note, um, so in blue we have the whole population um, who, who don't have a psychiatric disorder and in green we have the children with a psychiatric disorder. Look at the proportion of children having mental health re um, related contacts with the education system. It's enormous. 
and there is much more mental health work, quote unquote, going on in the education system than there is in the um, health system. And this translates to absolutely massive costs. And that's probably an underestimate because I got the data from speaking to parents and from parent report, and parents won't know about the additional discussions in the staff room um, that happen necessarily. They will know about the meetings that they've come to and interventions offered their children in school. So we're already spending a fortune on mental health in schools. But what parents told me, and the study wasn't really set up to measure this in any coherent way, was these were mainly meetings, and they were mainly disciplinary crises. And mainly there was a meeting and everybody went away afterwards and not much was done. So we're spending a lot of money that if we could divert it into something more therapeutic, we might have um, quite an impact. So the most extreme um, form of impact of, of children's mental health in the school situation is when the school, the school placement actually breaks down. So exclusion from school, either fixed term or suspension or um, permanent exclusion or expulsion. Um, and surprisingly little research has been done on this when we looked at it. You, in your packs, you have a, a brief slide that shows two systematic re reviews we did. One that studied um, it, the proportion of children with psychiatric disorder who have been excluded from school, and the other looking the other way around, at children with psychiatric disorders, how many have been excluded. And we found um, five studies for the first one and nine for the second one, and none had studied it as a primary research question. So the 2004 um, British Child Mental Health Survey had a question about, has your child ever been excluded? And this work came out of my clinical experience where Myself and also my boss, who is a community paediatrician, had had a series of children referred who'd had difficulties right from school entry, who had neurodevelopmental problems, autism, ADHD, mixtures, mixtures thereof. But what the school was experiencing was their behaviour and the neurodevelopmental problem had been masked and hadn't been recognised. And then by the time you see them, there's a child who is really struggling, a school that's really struggling and it's all a bit of a mess. So I went into this work thinking, well, is, is there a problem of recognition here? Um, so we went to the, um, we looked at recognition in terms of the SDQ impact scale. Well, there's a question at the beginning that says, basically, does this child have a problem? And if a parent or a teacher had said, yes, this child has a problem, we took that as meaning their, their problem had been recognized. And then, of course, you had psychiatric diagnosis um, at baseline. Um, so you have four groups. You have children with a disorder and whose problems have been recognised. You have children with a disorder whose problems haven't been recognised. And then you have a subclinical group where they don't meet diagnostic criteria, but people are worried about them. And a group where there are no problems and nobody's worried about them. And we were wrong. I mean, you do, you do research to look at a question and sometimes your hypothesis is wrong. Actually, the children who are most likely to be excluded three years later, and it's over four times as likely to be as excluded, were the children where the parents and or teachers were worried about them. So it's not a failure of um, recognition. Robert would shoot me for this slide because I've got... Um, dimensional data in terms of SDQ data with proportions. So we look at the SDQ, first of all. This was from a small case control study that Claire Parker, a PhD student of mine who did the exclusion work, um, did, where we consecutively recruited children who were excluded from school. Um, and we had this small sample. We tried to find some controls um, who are of similar ages in different schools because it's quite sensitive. And I really wasn't very happy that we'd managed to find adequate controls. So we've also put the national survey data on there. And I think the take home message was there's massive, massive distress. If you remember back to the graph of the SDQs, cut points um, around you know, the late teens, these children's average SDQ score was above that cut point and many times higher than the controls. And there was one child in our sample of 50 that didn't have a psychiatric disorder. Massive, massive um, m a mental health problem. However, disruptive behavior predominates. 
So again, we were wrong. This wasn't about neurodevelopmental problems um, driving it in the main. I should say the sample was between age four and 12, so it was all the way through primary school and then the first year of secondary school because there are some very supportive primary schools um, that get children through and then secondary school just becomes one challenge too many. However, there were quite a lot of emotional, children with emotional disorders and also children with um, autism and ADHD. Again, recognition wasn't the problem. It was about not referring because people thought the referrals wouldn't be picked up. It was about referrals that hadn't been picked up. It was about children on waiting lists. But these children's school career and life trajectory, if you're permanently excluded in primary school, were being really severely um, affected. For a different study, we created this very brief measure um, about how children feel at school. This was for a trial, and I was really determined to get the children's voice in there somehow. But it's really difficult to find something that children as young as four can um, answer reliably and validly. And the measure is available if people want to use it for nothing um, via the Exeter School, uh, via, via the Exeter University we website. And it won't surprise anybody that our children who are being excluded were not as happy at school. I mean, that's just not rocket science. What was deeply shocking to me was the level of self-harm. If this is parent-reported, so it's probably an underestimate, and um, it's 10 times the amount that we found. And in children up to the age of 12, just for the practitioners in the, in the room, don't forget to ask about this, because I'm not sure I always would in such young children. I won't present the ASPAC data because it mirrors the British Child and Adolescent Mental Health Survey data, but just to say we can see these children coming, particularly the boys. So we split, we split it by gender because um, there were very many more boys um, than girls, almost no girls. So the dotted line is the SDQ scores um, by age um, for boys and then for girls, and the, the solid line is the children who hadn't been excluded. So the boys were coming into school with problems. We can absolutely see them coming, and that's an opportunity to intervene. I'm fighting a losing battle, and it seems that every day I get up and I take him to school, I'm fighting another battle again. And again today, another battle has begun. That's one of my researchers voicing over some of the parents from our SKIP study. Um. Yeah, and I've found that some parents that I used to chat with in the playground, I don't feel they're as ready to chat anymore, which is quite isolating. So again, I'm, I'm just going to skim over this just to flag up. It's published if, if people want to read it in more depth. We interviewed parents and we interviewed teachers. The teacher's data is not yet published. And actually, the stories were the same. There was a lot of distress about a really awful situation for that class, that teacher, that family, that child around these children who were really struggling in primary school. Children don't either cope or not cope. There is a continuum that these children move backwards and forwards. And there's a very complex journey before, <coughs> for most children before the um, exclusion happens. And the family and context is really important, but then so is the school context. And I do wonder if we did a more systematic assessment of children's mental health and children's learning. There was a, um, quite a lot of data on children's abilities and attainment um, if you were coming to an exclusion. So that there are some children who are never going to cope in mainstream. Their, their problems are just too severe. But should the, tra should the transition not be planned because it's for their benefit rather than with an exclusion that implies that they have failed. However, um, what has also come through in other work that I've done around um, ADHD and supporting children in ADHD is, is that teachers are so torn between supporting the one with major difficulties and the rest of their class. It's a really, really hard task to do and not one that I think I'd be up to. But I didn't feel we could openly converse about what school could perhaps do differently. I just got the impression that they were doing everything they could, that it wasn't working, and that he was the problem. 
In every case, the children are behaving in a way we don't fully understand, and we know there is something underlying it, and quite often you have concerns around parenting and home, and those kind of things, and that's not our remit. So picking up on that, teaching is a hugely um, stressful profession, and we burn through our teachers very quickly. The, the attrition um, is just phenomenal, and that's a waste of talent, and it's a huge impact on the individual's concern. Um, so from the baseline of the STARS study, our, our trial um, involving teachers, we've also examine teachers' mental health. Um, so this is baseline data from 82 teachers compared to the reference sample in the manual for the Maslach burnout inventory. And I'm pleased to say um, that our teachers are not statistically more cynical than corporate America, <laughs> but they are statistically more tired. And these were at the beginning of the school year, where actually people should be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I could imagine if it was the, the July measures, maybe they would be quite tired. And they don't feel they can do their jobs as well. Their professional efficacy is lower. When you look at depression, the um, measurements are even more stark. So on, on your left, we have the Everyday Feelings Questionnaire, which measures psychological distress in primary school teachers from the STAR study against caregivers from the National Survey. The, the, the mean score for teachers is almost double. And then on the right, we have um, data from um, the WISE study, Wellbeing in Secondary School Education, being run by Judy Kidger out of Bristol, that I'm also involved with, compared to both the US population and the German population, because we couldn't find um, British norms. And the percentage of um, teachers with moderate or severe depression is truly shocking. So what can we do about this? We have behaviour as one of um, the most common mental health problems in children that predicts to every adult psychiatric disorder there is. Um, we have teachers who say that behaviour and managing it is what drives them out of the profession, who are dedicated, hard-working professionals who are struggling with their own stress levels. Well, the evidence-based treatment, if you like, or intervention for behaviour at home is parent training. And when um, the Webster, Carolyn Webster Stratton developed her programme, it was for children with conduct disorder, and it had three parts. It had a programme for teachers to hone how the, the teacher managed these very difficult children, and also a, a version for the child themselves. And, you know, Stephen and others have done a huge amount of research on the parenting program, and if you're only going to take one bit of it, that's the common sense bit to intervene. But some parents can't because they've got too many jobs or they haven't got a car and they live in a rural area or just from their own stresses and trains can't get to a parenting group. And actually intervening with parents um, when the problem is school-based, because you can have problems of behaviour that only occur in the school situation, is not going to make any, um, any difference. Are there any teachers brave enough to put up their hand here if they think they can get their pupils to make their beds at home? <laughs> I, I can't get my children to make their beds um, in my own home. You know, you can't influence behaviour when you... You know, obviously, I'm, I'm being a bit flippant. There are things that parents do that are hugely important that influence their their child's behaviour in the classroom, but actually the teacher and the teaching assistants are in the classroom, and maybe we can intervene with them. So the teacher classroom management course, which is, um, is very similar in principle to the parenting course, so it's based on operant conditioning, that what you pay attention to, what you incentivise is what you get, um, but also for teachers, um, Bandura's um, theories around modelling and self-efficacy. So it involves um, quite a lot of role plays. So you'll set up a scenario where one teacher will play a child who's being a bit disruptive. Somebody else will be the, play the teacher. Somebody else, again, will be the teacher's internal monologue, kind of coaching them on what they could be saying to themselves if they're in a particularly stressful situation. So they've got a child sitting under a table and they won't come out or, or whatever. Um, and also, more recently, Carolyn's woven in bits of attachment theory because she's constantly updating and improving her programmes. 
Teachers come along for six days. They are spread out with about a month in between them because the idea is that it's collaborative. The group leaders we've used in our trial are, all have a teaching qualification and experience. They know about the program. The teachers bring the expertise in their class and their teaching practice. And the idea is you think of solutions together about being more proactive. So yes, there is a huge emphasis on being positive in terms of praising what you want, being clear about the behavior that you want so the expectations are clear, and being proactive around um, children who have difficulties. So if Johnny can only sit for five minutes, you give him a reason to get up at four and a half minutes, and you say, well done, you sat for a long time. Um, and then gradually you get it a bit, bit more complicated for him to, to scaffold. It's not just about being nice to students. So that it's making sure that you have very clear expectations and that, you know, if children step outside them, there is, if you do this, then this will happen and you follow through with the consequences. But if you get the foundation of the clear expectations and the lots of praise for what you do want, then the sanction shouldn't be needed to be used very often. But rather than me banging on about it, hear from one of the um, teachers on the course. Uh, I think the main thing about STARS is getting you into the frame of mind where you don't always have to pick up on the negatives and that you're constantly celebrating the good things that are happening and that's um, meant to make all the other children realise that you get attention for behaving well and, and it's not necessarily trying to get attention for not behaving well and in theory that should make everybody want to behave brilliantly and it does work and I think it takes a while to get into that mindset but the more time I spent going to the course and having the training, the more I realised how it changes the way that you think. And when you come back into the classroom that you consciously need to think about picking up on positive things. But the more you do it, the more repetitive it becomes and the easier it is to spot all the wonderful things that children do and praise them for that rather than focusing on the negative and just almost ignoring the negative things. So the STARS trial, um, which um, we're just finishing, and it's just beginning to get really exciting, involved 80 primary schools. So we stripped it back in these all stored steer times to so the smallest dose we could possibly do. So one teacher per school, because we were worried about contamination. Teachers share good practice, which is a good thing to do um, in practice. It's a nightmare if you're trying to run a trial. Um, so one teacher per school, and we recruited classes that had to be single year groups, and I'll explain why in, later, that were either foundation or reception up to year four because we wanted to follow them up for two years and we wanted, it's easier to do if they're still in the same school. This is our logic model. Um, you've got it in your packs, so I won't spend a huge amount of time on it. Um, but you have your intervention. You have the wider context, which actually is hugely important. The call I answered, I mean, this was a study I was talking to Stephen about before I even moved to Exeter, and that's nearly 10 years ago. Um, and then this call came out slightly before I was ready to go, but I had some pilot data, so we went for it. And it was about pr the promotion of social and emotional health and well-being. But by the time I was getting funding, because there, there is a kind of several stage process to this, the government had changed and, and the push was, well, this has got to address behavior and discipline. So there is, a, there is a context. Outside the school, there is a culture within the school. So we have some teachers who say, well, it's working really well in my classroom, but actually my head observed a lesson and they're worried about what Ofsted will think about if I'm ignoring disruptive behavior. Um, all of that impinges. But the idea is that um, the teachers become more confident, more reflective. They um, widen their knowledge um, on different classroom strategies because they're sharing it with the group leaders and um, nine other colleagues. They become better at proactively reinforcing children, and they are less stressed. The impact on the child is that the, their own disruptive behavior drops down. They're happier, they're more ready to learn, there's more pro-social behavior and emotional re um, regulation, so they feel better. And as a class, um, there's a clear understanding of what is expected. 
that's being reinforced all the time, it's a nicer place to be. And so there are shared outcomes in terms of better relationships across the board. And the longer term outcomes is that hopefully teacher mental health and stress level improves, that children learn better and that their mental health is better. So this is what the trial looked like. Um, in each year group, um, we had an intervention arm and a control arm, and how you got into that was completely random. It was randomized independently from us, but essentially like flipping a coin. Um, we started off with a pilot phase so we could learn of 15 schools, because you can't get around 80 schools in one term. And if you're doing a trial in the clinic, you recruit people on an ongoing basis, but we were constrained by the school year in terms of when we could collect data. The next year, we went with 30 schools, and the final year was 35 schools. This is one of the slides that's not in your pack. This is one I would be willing to share if people want to share it. It's not the one I don't want you to um, copy. But it's to show you the quality of the data. So we retained all but one school over 30 months. Um, we had good balance on, between the arms of the schools on um, all the school characteristics. We had more four-year-olds um, in the intervention arm. It's just the way it pans out. Um, and therefore, we had poorer reading, or fewer who were reading fluently. But I think that's probably a function of the fact that we had more four-year-olds, because most four-year-olds don't read fluently. The teachers in the intervention arm were older, they were more distressed, and they felt less able to do their jobs. Um, but paradoxically, in the control group, there were more teachers with more than five years' experience. So I think we just, just did, as happens sometimes, you want your randomization to give you two completely similar groups. I think we just happened to get quite a lot of graduate teachers who've gone off and done other things and then come into teaching in our intervention arm. And you'll see from the bottom line, this is data on the children on um, our primary outcome measure and we're really, really proud of that. 30 months, we've got data on 85% of the children. We had excellent attendance. So I think that demonstrates the um, acceptability of the intervention for teachers. And this is what the group leaders who we trained up said about the course. Something that the teachers highlight in their feedback many times is that it gives them a chance to share good practice with colleagues and also to share difficulties or worries as well in terms of classroom management in general and individual children's difficulties. This gives them an outside viewpoint, another perspective from practitioners who were in the trench at the moment. Kind of a bottom-up approach. So you start off with building relationships and having a predictable classroom routine and structure and using praise and incentives before you get to the kind of hard-nosed stuff of sanctions and discipline. It's got such a rich content, both in terms of quality and content. So um, our outcome measures were children's mental health, as measured by the Strengths and Difficulties questionnaire. Um, the child voice was how I feel about my school, affectionately known as high fams. Um, and then because the SDQ has five, five items on um, behavior, but they're tilted towards really quite antisocial behavior, and they don't kind of get at the kind of behavior that makes school an unpleasant place to try and learn for children and for teachers to manage in terms of the low level disruption. So. Um, we created a measure called the Pupil Behaviour Questionnaire. We've also had a go at um, assessing academic attainment. We haven't analysed that yet. And we had teacher wellbeing and self-efficacy. And again, we're, I'm not going to present that today. So the Pupil Behaviour Questionnaire actually is derived from a, a measure that's never been validated but has been used in all the school effectiveness literature. So it's a much longer questionnaire and it was designed to be used across primary and secondary. So there were lots of things in there that would be really, really unusual to come across in the primary context. But also we were asking teachers to complete these on their whole class and we were asking them to do SDQ. So it had to be very, very brief. So we pulled out the six items that we thought really got to the nub of the question, and we validated it. And again, for anyone who wants to use it, you can download it and use it free of charge from the Exeter Medical School website. So in terms of our trial, we recruited people in the summer term so that they were ready to go. 
at the beginning of the autumn term, we gave schools a week to settle down, and then a letter went out to parents to say the study was going on, and if they didn't want their child to be part of the research, could they please opt them out? And then, just before half term, we ran round like the proverbial blue flies with blue bottoms, going round all these schools, getting all these measures, um, and then could randomise at half term so the teachers could plan their attendance at the course. So after half term in, in the autumn term, the course started for those in the intervention arm, and we had teaching as usual in the um, control arm. And then we went back in June to collect our outcome measures from all schools again. And then we checked in with them with the following February, by which point they're with a different teacher. And then again, the February after that. Um, the STAR studies really helped us get positive feedback on how we're dealing with behaviour in school. About a year ago, we had a couple of parents saying that we weren't, they didn't really see how we were dealing with disruptive behaviour. And actually, as we've gone through the STAR study process, I've had parents commenting in my class specifically saying how they've really enjoyed how behaviour strategies are personalised to children and that we're focusing on the positive and those sanctions that we talk about with the parents and the consequences with the children are a last resort and actually we've tried a lot of things with the children before we get there so we've had a lot more communication with the parents and understanding on their behalf so they can see that we are trying even though we're not punishing as they may want us to. So I tried to get NIHR um, to pay for us to go and observe all the schools but they wouldn't because it's very time consuming to go in and observe every single school, but we did manage to go in and observe about um, a quarter of them. So we took a measure developed by Judy Hutchings out of work that Carolyn Webb Stratton had done, which is a tally where you look um, for particular behaviours that match on to what the course is um, trying to change. Um, I changed it slightly from what Judy had done because she elected to have particularly di difficult children identified, and then you went in and you observed the teacher in relation to those children. They came unstuck a couple of times when those index children were either not there or behaving beautifully, and then you can't rate anything, so we just rated the teacher, um, and we double rated quite um, a, a proportion of them with um, good agreement between raters, and we went to huge... Um, uh, huge trouble to try and keep our um, raters blind. So the raters were junior researchers and PhD students who worked in the building where the course was run and there were times where they were banned from going to the loo or going out of their offices because the teachers were having coffee and we didn't want people to accidentally see somebody. Half the time they were able to correctly guess at the end of the study which teachers had been in the intervention arm and two-thirds of the time they correctly can dress the control teachers. So we didn't, I guess, half the time is 50-50, it's chance. It could be chance, or maybe not. And what we did detect was an increased use of labelled praise in relation um, to unlabeled praise or not praising children. So in these 22 schools, statistically significantly, we have altered teachers' behaviour. And that's quite important because actually if we don't find a result, is it because we didn't train the teachers properly or is it because the, the course doesn't work? So it, it was really important to me to see if we could pick up a signal about changing teachers' behaviour. I should say, this teacher is a colleague of the teacher you just heard who was talking about the course in her school. He didn't go on the course, but he's inherited the children that she taught last year. Okay, so as, as part of the STAR study, I feel the class, this class in particular, have got a lot more energy and a lot more desire to, to do the right thing and a lot more desire to, to learn. And their attitude towards learning as a direct consequence, I think, to what's been going on as a result of the STAR study. Um, I feel they are more. They feel more aware of what they should be doing positively in terms of their behaviour and where they should be. And for young children of five and six years old to be in control like that is definitely different to what's happened in the past with similar age group classes. So what these guys can achieve and what these guys have done is significantly different from previous year groups. Okay, I don't know whether that's a result of the STAR study, but we are looking at children here now at this point who are greater control of their own behaviour and the greater and make greater progress. 
this school has completely rewritten their behaviour policy. And those two teachers get incoming teaching assistants and teachers to read Carolyn's book and coaches on them on that, and they've just taken the programme and just made it part of what they do. Um, and they're, they're enthusiastic. It won't be like that in every single um, classroom. And actually, what Clarilyn Webster Stratton would recommend and has done to me and my group leaders vociferously at every supervision, because we had her kindly, she Skyped in to supervise the group leaders to check that we were delivering with fidelity as well as we possibly could. Um, she would recommend that actually there's coaching of teachers in between the sessions, which we didn't put in because we weren't sure that our government at the moment would fund that and wanted to test it as it would be funded. Um, but I, I would argue it probably adds. So around trials, you have your questionnaire measures, um, but also you do a, pro you do a process um, evaluation about understanding the challenges and opportunities and barriers to what's going on. And, and this is what group leaders and teachers have said to us. From the feedback at the end, it was like we'd turned their entire lives around. They'd actually been under so much pressure and they were feeling stressed and they were feeling inadequate that to have been given new tools seemed to help their confidence and get it back. I think one thing I grasp is the idea that we are important, teachers, and how much we do mean to the children and how we can actually make a difference. It's changed me and I think my relationship towards the children, I take far more interest in them as individuals and far more interest in their personal lives as well. My whole mindset has changed. Everything I've learnt at uni, it's not gone out the window, but I think my mindset and my practice and the way I deliver my lessons and my behaviour management has completely changed because of the things we've discussed, the way I've learnt from others here. And Ed Sykes said, there's no way I would have said you're an NQT watching your behaviour management. It definitely has more impact and it leads to, you know, um, a happier classroom. The kids have confidences up, they're more willing to do things and try really hard because if they know they're doing what you've asked them to do, they're going to get the praise, they're going to get the rewards. So this is the slide, please don't photograph, please don't tweet. This has been through our data monitoring and ethics committee, it's been through the study group but it hasn't been peer reviewed. We have a small but statistically significant improvement on teacher reports of mental health at nine months. So that's the teacher SDQ. It's not sustained beyond that into the follow-up time period, and we can think about why that might be. But we do have better classroom behaviour, which wasn't the primary outcome, so child mental health was the primary outcome. We have better classroom behaviour sustained across all three time points. And bear in mind that the teachers rating at 18 and 30 months are not the teachers that taught the intervention. So there's a lot of noise in there. There are different people rating. The other thing we have is those with poorer mental health, according to the SDQ, seem to respond more. And that's why I think the coaching might um, be particularly um, effective. We don't find a difference in children's happiness, despite what those teachers said. And we don't seem to be having much an impact on teacher mental health. Um, although, a conversation with, with somebody around their outcome measures, they said, you know, I don't think these measures are really picking up what's happening in the course, because in the classroom it's wonderful, but there is so much else that's making teaching a really stressful, unpleasant profession to be in at the moment. And one of the things we might not have done is measured the relationship. Well, we didn't, but what's come out of this work is the relationship between the teacher and the pupils is really changing, and we didn't measure that. This work has been done with a huge number of other people, and I'll shut up at that point.